we have a classic case of what a lot of males will do. Um, with this one, we call this a triple. Um, you can see the larger female here. And then it looks like this male might be the male that is directly attached to her. This male on the other side, however, is what we like to call a satellite male. Satellite males can actually fertilize 40% of the eggs if they're in the vicinity. So although he might not be directly attached behind her, he is still contributing to fertilizing her eggs. So satellite males are pretty uh, productive. So under here, despite the fact that she's completely buried, there is a female if I can get rid of some of the sand. Can I see her? She's there somewhere. There she is. Oh, now this guy's trying to get in on the action, but um, this one, whoops. This one looks like the male that's actually attached to her, and then we have two satellite males on either side. Not to mention that we got a few males running around out here. You can see they're actually trying to get in. mate with each other because they uh, haven't really figured it out yet. I'm a little confused. Here comes another satellite male. Oh. Sometimes even just, <laughs> just Brianna right. just uh, <laughs> females just because they're moving and <laughs> try to mate with their feet. Um, we find them attached to rocks and jetties and things like that. There we go. Um, again, large female is under here. You can see the top of her. Um, this looks like the male who is actually the one that is attached to her. And we have male number one, two, and three satellites who, um, I don't know how successful he is being, but uh, two and three here are, are definitely contributing to um, fertilizing her eggs. He's kind of far away. He might think, this one might think that this man is in fact the female and is a little confused, but um, for the most part, he is probably contributing somewhat to uh, fertilizing her eggs. Uh, he must have figured it out. I think he let go. A lot of times you'll see the, um, the males bucking each other off. Female looks like she might be coming out of the nest right now. So, um, like we were talking about before, as the tide recedes, they come up with the high tide, and then as the tide recedes, she will um, crawl out of the nest. So, because the water is getting low, she's decided to get a move out. But uh, so many males around her, she's having a hard time. He's just gonna crawl right over. She's bigger than him, though. She can uh, just mow him down. So, um, shorebirds actually really depend on horseshoe crab eggs. In Delaware Bay, the red knots, which is probably the most famous case of a horseshoe crab bird interaction, the red knots fly up from Tierra del Fuego, which is right under the uh, Strait of Magellan in Argentina, and they fly all the way to Suriname, and then they fly to Delaware to replenish their, their energy reserves on horseshoe crab eggs, and red knots primarily feed on horseshoe crab eggs. Um, in Delaware, there was a big fertilizer industry, bait industry, blood industry, and a lot of the horseshoe crabs were harvested and killed, which um, obviously lowered the amount of eggs. So, as the eggs weren't there, they noticed that the red knots were actually struggling too. And the red knots, I believe now are endangered, very close to extinction, because of the over-harvesting of horseshoe crabs. What's the mortality rate of the eggs, do you know? The eggs have a very, very high mortality rate. A female can lay up to 88,000 eggs in one summer. Because she has to lay a ton of eggs so that one or two of them will survive. Um, they're very susceptible to desiccation, predation. Um, watch out for you. Um, you know, weather, anything really can rupture a horseshoe crab egg. And it takes two weeks for the actual baby to leave the egg. So in that two weeks, I mean, it doesn't seem like a, a huge amount of time, but it is a, a pretty substantial amount of time to be in an egg when you're out in the elements with all of these predators around. Shorebirds are probably the biggest predator. Um, I do think other fish and things probably eat them, although I'm not sure. Just 15 minutes after a mating pair laid and fertilized eggs, a group of shorebirds moved in for lunch. He 
Besides learning about the research and the mating process for horseshoe crabs, I also learned a lot about their history and physiology. Known as a living fossil, horseshoe crabs are some of the oldest creatures on the planet, having changed very little in their makeup in the past 445 million years. They are actually closer to spiders and scorpions than to crabs. Just based on the size and the activity of this crab, I'm gonna assume that it's a lone male. Um, the way to tell if it's a male or a female is, the best way is by this club claw right here in the front. On the fold, buddy. You see the club claw in the front is um, different than the rest of just the pincers. The adult males have the club claw so that they can hold on to the female, which is um, when you see them in pairs, that's what he's holding on with this club claw. He's holding on to her uh. right back here. Um, the females, he's holding his own hand, the females just have pincers for the front claw. Mm -hmm. So if you're unsure of what a crab is just based on its size, because there is a size overlap, some of our smaller females and our larger males here in Wellfleet are questionable size. Somewhere around 21 millimeters is a questionable size for a crab. Um, this guy is a little smaller than that. So the club claw is the best way to tell. Males also have a prosomal curve, meaning just this area right here is curved, whereas on females it's really straight. The males need it to be curved so that when they latch on with their club claw, it's not uncomfortable and they have a, a curve where they fit into the female. Males are also smaller than the females, I don't know if I said that. Um, there is also the official way to tell, so I like to call it. Um, I don't know if you could see in there, but the males have two yellow prongs. Um, the females in the same spot just have two white kind of slits. And that's really um, the official way to tell. That's how we tell on juveniles because they don't get the club claw until their last molt, until they become sexually mature. So if we have a juvenile and we're trying to tell what sex it is, we'll tell the official way. And um, he has a ton of epibionts and barnacles on him, so we can assume that he's an older crab because this kind of growth wouldn't be on a younger crab that has just molted. There's just no way that they would, that these slipper shells and barnacles would be able to grow that much in that short amount of time. So that's a male horseshoe crab. Whoops. There you go. Breathe oxygen through book gills. So um, they do have gills like fish. Um, well, I wouldn't say like fish. They're called book gills because if they have six flaps and if you were to lift up a flap it would look like the pages of a book. Um, I can show you one if I find a single male again. There's one over there. Oh there's one right here. Oh he's actually in our quad so let's count him. He thinks the stick is a female I think. <laughs> so these right here are their gills and um, the first one is just a flap but um, let's see if he will let me do this. You can see they're almost like the pages of a book if I were to flip them. Try to do that one more time. And they do exchange oxygen through those. Um, one really neat thing about horseshoe crabs is that they can breathe out of water just as long as their gills stay wet. So they, they aren't like fish where when they get out of water they just kind of flop around and have a really hard time. These guys can breathe out of water as long as their gills stay wet. Basically horseshoe crabs have 10 eyes. Oh, what are you doing buddy? He is not happy. They have the two compound eyes, they see like a fly's eye, and then they have eight other photoreceptors. Hey, two are right there above the eyes of the two little dots. There's three right in the front, it kind of looks like his nostrils almost. Then there's one right there, another there, and another there. And those are for if he's flipped upside down, he can see that it's dark. They sense dark and light. So when he's upside down, he sees that he's dark, he knows that he needs to flip himself over again. And they have a huge optic nerve that's pretty much the size of ours that people are basically studying and trying to figure out how like, do research on our own optic nerve and see if they can figure things out that way. So that's basically the horseshoe crab's eyes.